The reading is from John chapter 18, verses 33 through 37, and is on page 881 of your Pew Bible. <clears throat> then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king, for this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The game of choice when I spent time with my grandpa Stanton was checkers to step up from tic-tac-toe. You're trying to make lanes for your pieces to get to their last row so you can say, king me, right? What an exciting moment that is. A second checker gets stacked onto the first and now the king can go anywhere the king wants to go, forward, backward. You're just looking for jumps, double jumps, maybe even setting up your opponent for a triple jump. Grandpa could do that to me. I could never get a triple jump on him. But that's basically all there is to checkers. Chess uses the same board, but it's way more complicated, right? Pawns move one square at a time. Bishops go diagonally. Rooks go straight. Knights, well, they, they, it's kind of weird, actually. One up, two to the side, or two up, one to the side in any direction. And the queen can get to wherever she wants to go, however she wants to get there. While the king mostly just remains stuck in one spot, maybe moving one spot, allowing all the other pieces to defend him until they fail. I have read and studied and preached on this text we have today for Christ the King many, many times. And what I see in the text this time is that Jesus, as always, is playing chess while everybody else is playing checkers. The passion narrative that we read on Good Friday every year starts with John chapter 18 and goes through the end of chapter 20. So with today's text, we're in the middle of the most famous of all the Jesus stories. It's a fascinating moment when Jesus and Pilate take each other on. Pilate, remember, is the military governor of this part of the world that the Roman Empire is occupying. And Pilate is in a pickle. He wakes up to a hot mess on what was already supposed to be a stressful day. We'd call this day Friday. The day before this particular Friday had been Jewish Passover, which always begins a week-long festival, what Jews call their Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, in the midst of this high and holy moment in the calendar year, Pilate finds out early in the morning that the natives are restless. Jewish leaders have apparently been up all night dealing with this Jesus of Nazareth. One of this guy's own followers, Judas, something or other, had asked Pilate's soldiers to help their own Jewish police arrest Jesus, which they did. First, they took Jesus to Annas and then Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. And Caiaphas had been telling people that with all the trouble Jesus was stirring up, resurrecting Lazarus, making the Pharisees look foolish, all the things, Caiaphas thinks it'd be better to have one person die for all the people than get the whole nation into trouble, which he thinks is what's happening. So when the high priest has his conversation with Jesus about Jesus' disciples and the teachings of Jesus, it doesn't go very well. The middle-of-the-night decision that the high priest makes is to take Jesus to Pilate's headquarters and have Pilate deal with him. It's early in the morning. 
on what will prove to be the day when Jesus dies. Pilate himself comes out to meet the group that has brought this Jesus, and Pilate asks, what's the charge? And they're like, hey, like if he wasn't a criminal, we wouldn't be here. And Pilate's like, no, 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 no. Uh -uh. Take him yourselves and judge him. I don't need this. Not today. So they say to Pilate, but we aren't permitted to put anyone to death. And this is when you can almost hear the gears of Pilate's mind working. Like, okay, so they want this guy dead for whatever reason, so they bring him to me? Because Roman justice is the only way people are killed legally, but they don't really have a charge against him, so I gotta find a charge. Okay, we can do that. And that's where our text picks up for today. Pilate brings Jesus in and cuts right to the chase. So are you the king of the Jews? He asks him. See, if Jesus says yes, well, that's going to make it a clear-cut case. Jesus would be in opposition to Caesar, a capital offense, because Caesar's the Roman emperor, and Jesus would be proclaiming himself as king, and, well, that would earn him death on a cross. Perfect. Just say yes, Jesus, is what Pilate could have been hoping for here, but he doesn't. Instead, Jesus says, Are you asking for yourself, or did others tell you about me? Mmm, sassy. I mean, Jesus is not saying yes here. He's also not saying no. In fact, he's kind of implying he is a king, and wondering whether that piques an interest in Pilate himself. So Pilate clarifies, I'm not a Jew. Your own people have handed you over. What have you done? Of course, it's not about what he's done about who he is, who he loves, how he loves. We know he is God. He loves all. How? Creatively, persistently, through death and far beyond. What have you done? Pilate's playing checkers, trying to come up with something, some crime that'll justify the death penalty. Jesus is playing chess, using Pilate's short-term thinking to express God's eternal truth that death, for Jesus, is no penalty. In fact, death and the resurrection that's going to follow will become the way Jesus expresses his true ultimate power, his actual ultimate authority. Are you a king? Jesus could have said something like, let me show you who I am. Oh, and actually... You're the one who's going to help me do the showing of who I am. Pilate has a sign made that'll go over Jesus' cross that reads, King of the Jews. He has his soldiers flog Jesus, then dress him up in a purple robe and a crown of thorns to make a violent point. The king, whether he says that's what he is or some of you Jews say so, don't forget, all of you, the destiny of such fools. Rome, the empire, will strike back at anything that provides a threat. No threat is too big or too small. In its paranoia, the empire will always humiliate, beat, and kill all its perceived enemies. King of the Jews, whatever. Checkers. That's as big as Pilate can imagine. Because worldly empires just don't have the capacity for creativity. They don't do anything new. They simply stoke fear, wield violence. 2,000 years ago, all the way through today. Be afraid or be hurt, or both. But Jesus does have capacity for creativity. Jesus doesn't only do new things. He is what is new. So Jesus allows the betrayal, the sham trial, even the beatings and the mockery, because the whole thing, the whole crucifixion story altogether, it illustrates who the true king of kings is and how persistently that king of kings is willing to love all, even those who are doing all this to him. The last thing Jesus says to Pilate is, You say that I am a king. For this I was born. For this I came into the world 
to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. In other words, label me as king if that's what you need to do. Just know that whatever form of darkness you do, I will creatively use it to shine a light on the truth that I am here. Famously, Pilate asks him, what is truth? Jesus could have answered, oh, I'm about to show you. You and everyone, forever. Truth is not trumping up a false charge in order to qualify an innocent person for crucifixion or any other crime. Truth is not imposing violence and stoking fear among the less powerful so that they can remain the less powerful. Truth is not them and us. And most importantly, truth is not death. Death itself, which feels more true than anything, more true than any empire, more true than any religion, it can feel, death can feel more true than God. But Jesus shows us it's not. The resurrection of a person who walked this earth, that Jesus did not remain dead. Does that really sink in? Past your scientific minded, reasonable, cynical, postmodern brain? <laughs> I mean, can it? Do we really allow the greatest good news ever told to get past our logical sensibilities and into our hearts, into our soul? Because if Jesus, a person, born of a human mother who lived a human life, if he didn't stay dead but rose, well, that could change everything. That could mean death is not all there is. And if death is not the end it claims to be, if death is not true, if Jesus has power and authority over death, well, then that could mean that Jesus has power and authority over everything. Life, death, everything in between, as he chooses. If death isn't the truth, then Jesus, the one who conquers death, is king of the hill, if you want to think of it that way. Pilate asks, what is truth? Jesus could have said, you're looking at him. Baptized into the faith of Jesus, we've been baptized into the truth also known as the way, the life. We follow the truth, the way, the life. And we do that by knowing way past our heads. Knowing in our hearts and our souls, even into our feet, into our hands, through our words. We follow the truth with all that we are as we keep faith through and far beyond the lies of this world. As we hope for light amidst whatever darkness the world is trying to throw at us. And as we love, even when the world gives us full permission to hate. The world plays checkers with us every day, hoping we'll never discover that we've been given access to an entirely other game. Sin, death, and the power of the devil, as Luther would say, want us to keep things very short-term, very cynical, very hopeless. Think Forgiveness is impossible. Think. Hope is foolish. Think. Church is just a bunch of hypocrites not worth my time. Strive for pleasure and power like everybody else seems to be. Make it all about me, 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 me. Make it all about the pursuit of my happiness till I die. Because that's all there is. Which we are to think is the truest power in this brief, scary, unfair life. Checkers. In the faith of Jesus, following Jesus, we stop playing death's false little game. We stop believing the lies, which I must admit are quite compelling. It's why I remain part of the church, because one of the things the church does is we remind each other so that we can remind the world that forgiveness and peace between people is possible. We've seen it. We've been a part of it even, maybe. 
In the faith of Jesus, the church reminds each other in the world that hope is actually a sign of wisdom. And that, yes, the church is full, full of hypocrites whom God claims anyway. The one true God is that good, that great. Together, the church and the faith of Jesus strives to include everyone, build community, and serve our neighbor, not just till we die, but in preparation for life eternal. Because none of the presidents or kings or queens of this world will last. This brief, scary, unfair life will pass away as a new creation gifted to all will live on. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing. Mm -hmm.